so today we're picking up our study. We're almost done with the book of Corinthians, the second book. Uh, so we're in chapter 12 now. I mean, it's going to take 10 verses, kind of chop that up a little bit, and then pick up the other rest uh, next week. But in the first 10 verses, um, we, we're going to learn something, or we, we're going to be, Paul is going to start again to uh, remind us the secret. You know, um, I don't know if you guys realize this, but there's, this, there's a secret in Scripture uh, for all believers. You know, they believe, you know, like I said, oh, my, you know, I'm kind of chaotic in my life, but I have peace. People call us crazy Christians, right? That, you know, that we retarded. But what we found is the secret, right? Uh, and the secret that Paul is revealing to us, he continues to reveal to us here, uh, you know, is us allowing ourselves to trust God and let God live through us through rough circumstances or through unfavorable times. Right? Usually when things aren't working our way, uh, we, we lose our mind and we think that God is doing something something bad uh, but a lot of times you know when stuff happens it, it, it's because there's something that God is doing in our life right you know I, I was thinking about um, this cloud back there right so today she walking in right and the other week I was here yeah, she came in with her chair right uh, and I was cracking up because, you know, I had a big trouble. So I wanted to race her to the car, but, you know, uh, she, she was like, ah, you're funny, you're funny. But today she's walking in, right? So I said, oh, now I'm going to race to go race again, you know? But here's the thing. I started to think about her uh, this week when I was working on the message. Uh, and, you know, although we don't understand why everything happened, if our heart is right with God, we can take whatever is happening and find an opportunity to bring glory to God. That is the purpose of our life, isn't it? To worship God. Now, when we worship God, it's more than just raising our hands and lifting our voices. Worshiping God, true worship, means we live a life regardless of what the circumstances around us are looking like or feel like, with the heart of rejoicing that God is in control. We let God have His way. You know, people will think, oh, no. Uh, so what was this? I was really wanting this one job. Uh, I was like praying, kind of like crying, praying, you know, to go get me out of this place. I want, I want this job. And it didn't happen. And I was like, wow. They didn't have to go through this stuff right there. I'm like, man, did I do something wrong? And I have to really think about this. I went into prayer, spent some time just uh, hanging out with God. Uh, and I was reminded that in my life, nothing happens by coincidence. You know, uh, no man is in control of my destiny. And so I had to get to this point where I realized that if the job didn't open up, it wasn't because death or man, it was because God had a different plan. And I have to trust that man. And when we trust that man, then there's a peace that comes within us that it cannot it don't make sense. Right? You know, I'm like, okay, Lord, you in control, I'll let you be God. I'll trust what you're doing and I'm gonna live my life. Even in unfavorable times, I'm going to live my life in such a way that I bring glory to your life, that I'm your name, by rejoicing. So, you know, like today, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting out there and I start crying. I'm like, what the heck? You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong, but the, 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 the heart of uh, the song you were singing, the song you were singing, uh, I know the peace speaker. Right? It just got me all on. I guess the word is humble. That I was able to just truly trust God and rest 
and the God that controls the wind and the rain. You know, and so uh, today, when we were to read this message, we're going to hear the message. It is really unbelievable that Paul found the secret, if you would, to trust God in the midst of his dilemma in his life. There's a bunch of stuff, you know, if you do the study of this guy, it's really, really unique. I mean, and he's just crazy. But let's get started because we can talk about him all day. So he says in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 6, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I, don't, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible uh, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that. But I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be uh, would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one would think more of me than is warranted by what I know or say, or by what I do or say. So we're reading out of the NIV, and I, I really uh, usually use the NLT, but I love the NIV today, and we're going to get the same translation as the uh, King James version. Uh, but you know, with the V's and the O's, I'm stick with this. Uh, but Paul is talking about himself here, and it seems that in the Corinthian church, and we've been talking about this as we were studying, that these so-called super apostles uh, that was infiltrating the church uh, had claimed to have a lot of these uh, awesome, crazy spiritual experiences of visions and revelations. Okay, and so Paul is pretty much fed up already with this. Okay, uh, and so we read in the last chapter that Paul said he's not going to boast about this thing. So we've been reading here, but now he says, it's time for me to speak up. And he calls, the, he's kind of crazy, because he goes, uh, I had enough of the foolishness, is what he said, okay? We have to take the word foolishness and um, kind of translate it. it. It's pretty much the same to them is that I had enough of your nonsense, right? Your lack of good sense, your, your, your judgment that you have. You see, by them talking down about Paul, they weren't just degrading Paul or bringing uh, bad, uh, talking bad about Paul. They were, they were actually degrading Jesus. And I want you guys to understand this. We as believers, anytime we go out and we do things that we're not supposed to do, we say things we're not supposed to be saying, we act just like these guys. This is what they say. We act foolish with lack of common sense. We don't realize that it's not our name that we be bad mommy. Right? Who, who, who catches the rap for our stupidity? The Lord does. Churches get hard time to fill the, the podium on the, 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 the pews or the seats and even the podium because people have been hurt by the church or hurt within the church because of this type of uh, nonsense. This kind of not having common sense. You know, um, I, I think it's so important that when we as believers claim to love the Lord, then we have to uphold to a certain standard. 
we, we have to be careful how many kinds of okay, I will do a small kind of test. I'll be part of the message, yeah? Small kind of event survey. How many of you guys came to church and got the DA had gossip? Anybody raise your hand? Yeah? Nobody even gossip ever. Yeah? Yeah, but you know what? Everybody gossip, I know. I've been in the church for a while. Yeah, when you're coming as a new Christian, you see something. As you get older, you get better. That's the great thing about the Lord. What about, uh, have anybody been hurt in the church? Yeah. Um, uh, what else? We had uh, judgment happen. Judgment, yeah. I mean, the, the thing about this, and we've been talking about this with the guys, uh, it's so important that we understand that when we come to the Lord, we are now representatives of the Lord, and we have to die to self. And we have to be careful as people who love the Lord, because if we're not careful, we turn into religious people. Right? We start looking at that person and say, well, you know, because of this, that's why this is happening. Oh, because of what she said, that's why that is happening. You know what? We will talk about this later on. But you have no idea what God is doing in somebody else's life. When you have a relationship and you build in a relationship and you start talking, it's different. But a lot of times what happens in the church is that people will tend to make judgment and people will tend to claim to have this wonderful experience and and and, and start to have all these things going in. And it's really sad because it damages the church from people from walking in and just saying, can they just love me for me? You know when I first walked into Hope Chapel, uh, it was Hope Chapel Kapole. And I walked into that church thinking, that this is going to be another story, another, you know, like, oh yeah, oh, Jesus loves you, oh yeah, we, we glad you came, you know, it does suck you in kind of thing, right? Uh, and, and, but once they get you in there, they be doing all this stuff, it's just a typical church stuff. Then I found out, uh, we ended up hanging out there a little bit longer, and then I found out that these, there's a bunch of guys that's in the church, they really love the Lord, had some weirdos. Yeah, I think we always going to have some of those. Uh, but there was a handful that really loved the Lord and sincerely loved me for how I was. Just the way I was. One of the things, the thing that uh, they used to share a lot was, come just as you are. Right? Uh, and uh, I was like, yeah, they say that, but they talk different, yeah? And then I learned that Wow, these guys, they really mean it. I see the pastor in shorts and rubber slippers. I was like, the guy need help. They should pray and rebuke that guy, you know. And then I was like, this is not right. And I realized that through the years of going in church, myself, I've gotten to be judgmental, almost religious. And so I, I had to really let God have his way and realize that I'm not here for you to look at me. If you're watching me, then too bad for you because you're missing out on the Holy Spirit that walked you past, looking for somebody to anoint and bless. You see, I believe this with all my heart, that God's house, if people are in there to worship God, He will come and visit the house. There's no stopping Him. He loves to meet with His people. He loves to reveal to His people the things He has planned. He loves to pour power into His people so that they can endure. And this is the story of uh, what, what we grab from Paul. It's really cool. These super, so-called superheroes, that's what they call them false teachers, came in with all these claims of you know, having the revelations and, and visions and people were getting stirred up by that and like, wow, looking at them and saying, oh, this is good stuff. And then Paul finally says, you know, now it's time for me to tell you something. Something that you seem to make your ears open up and listen. Let me share with you an experience. And I love the way uh, it's written in, in, in the different translations because 
he starts to tell them about this Christian guy that they know or that he knows, okay? But why does Paul address the Corinthian church this way? Well, I, I believe the Corinthian church again taught little of Paul and because they taught little of Paul they were actually taking little of God. We make the big mistake that if your life isn't perfect, then God not in your life. And that is so, so far from the truth. You know, I, I, I fell in love with the Bible. I never used to like the Bible because they get too much perfect people in there. Right? All these good guys and all these guys that's anointed. Then I started studying my Bible. I go, hey, you know what? These guys just like me, I get chance. They liars, deceivers, you know, with the orchards. I mean, like, wow, you know, I mean, these are the guys that history, that God wants to meet with people, have been written. And then I'm like, wow, that God can take somebody like me, as foolish as I am, as messed up as I am, and use me too. If I let him. Now, it says that he was uh, caught up in the third heaven. Now, we, you have to do some study and you start doing some... This is the hard part because you got to match dates and you go back and you put dates. I mean, it's really crazy. And so, you know, my question is, okay, so when did he have, to have this vision, right? We've got to understand that it's not the same vision that he had on his way to Damascus when he was persecuting the believers because that was a whole different vision and we know that that's not the same vision because he speaks about this man who is him being a Christian he didn't become a Christian to after he had met the Lord on the road of Damascus so he had another vision so when is the time frame how does this all get put together because you know um, one of the things I love about the Bible is it's written in such a way that you can make all the dots connect, but you got to know how to connect them. Otherwise, it's just like, ah, you know. But once you get them connected, then you go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. The story starts to weave a beautiful uh, plan of, of God working uh, of His hands in people's life. And then you start to see, if God is working that way, he can work that way in my life. And then you start looking for God in the different places where you would have not usually looked for Him. So, second, uh, the second verse says that uh, He was caught up in the turn of heaven. So, 14 years ago, He says, yeah, 14 years ago, uh, this man uh, had this experience. So, He's talking about Himself. 14 years ago, we calculate this stuff and we try to pinpoint things. The time frame would probably, or, or I should say, fits perfectly with the experience he had in Acts 14. In Acts 14, he already had become a Christian. He was sharing the word of God. He was in Lystra. And uh, they were just blowing up that place with Jesus. Crazy. Right? Uh, idol worshippers, man. These guys are just growing up with Jesus. And then they had some people from Antioch and uh, Iconia that had actually went to go and look for this guy and cause trouble. Right? you got to understand this, okay? I'm going to just let you guys know this. You, you, you guys better be ready, okay? Because you love the Lord, the devil is not going to just let you sit there and be happy. He, he's going to send people to look up for you and make trouble in your life. People gonna be gossiping, people gonna be talking, people gonna be pointing. And you gotta be ready for that. People gonna try to discredit your love for Jesus. They're gonna say, if they love Jesus, then why this? So it was happening with Paul, right? So these guys found Paul, follow Paul, find Paul in this show. He is doing great work, but they somehow got a whole bunch of guys on their side. And they did something really crazy. If you read the story, I believe it's Acts at, at 14. I think somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, 19 or somewhere around there. Go check them out just to make sure I'm not making bogus you guys. Uh, 
But what happened was after these these guys who was uh, actually now persecuting uh, uh, Paul had found him, they stirred up trouble and they got the bunch of people in uh, to go against him and they took him out of the city wall and they stoned him to death. Or they stoned him. Here's the thing, people cannot say that he died because they said after they stoned him, they walked away and then he got up and he walked back into the, the city. But here's something we know, so we gotta kinda like Cool history and and, and and the way they did things. You know, this guy was really good at stoning people. When they stoned people, they stoned them to kill them. They, they knew. In fact, uh, I don't want to get all crazy. I, 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 you, you read in Galatians that Paul talks about the scars or the, the beat, the battle scars that he has. He's talking most likely about this time. Because I don't know if you realize this. These guys are really good. The difference their team to kill people by stoning. So in Galatians, when you start reading it, you find, and I, I, I don't want to say, I think it's in 6, I'm not sure. But just read the whole thing, good reading anyway. <laughs> oh, but he talks about the scars that he got for loving Jesus. Yeah, and and so, when we look at this, he says, I was caught up in the tournament. It is most likely, if we put the connections, it was happening when he got stoned outside of the Shrooms, the city. Uh, they said that it is possible at that time when he had the encounter, the third heaven. So when we read in scripture, scripture writes of three heavens. We have the sky, we have the universe above, uh, around us, and then we have God's dwelling place. In Psalms, I believe, uh, 68, or I hate when I do that because I, I don't have good memory. Uh, uh, no excuse, but I don't. But I believe it's Psalm 68. <laughs> if not, read the whole song. <laughs> um, but we read of this third heaven being the heaven of heavens. Right? It is the dwelling place of the Lord. Paul says that he isn't sure if he was in the body or out of the body. You know, I really like this because, you know, I mean, I'm like trying to put the puzzle together, right? I don't know. It doesn't say in Scripture. Uh, but we hear of many people who have experienced uh, dying and then coming back and then sharing what they had seen uh, happen. Some guys never see heaven, right? Uh, but here is most likely uh, one of those experiences. In fact, I, I, it's not uncommon to see this. We read it in Isaiah, right? Isaiah talks about this time when he was in the head of the, 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 the dwelling place of God. He was in the presence of God. And he's talking how beautiful it was and the robe of the Lord, the train which just surrounded the whole still the temple. They would read in Revelation, you know, John had an experience. And his experience was uh, the Lord gave him a vision and revelation of the things to come. So, you know, when Paul is sharing this, it's really crazy because now he's saying, you guys want to hear about these visions and revelations. Let me tell you what God has done and what God has shown me. Something crazy about this. I love, I, I love Paul's the kind of stuff going on. He says that he heard inexpressible things that he couldn't share. Now, you read this, and I'm like, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, I, mean, I want to know all the details and stuff. But, I mean, there's some things that's just it's black and white. This is one of them. God, now all like us know. Whatever it was, we'll never know. Right? Whatever happened on the end of that vision, whatever took place in that time when Paul met with God was for Paul. And I want to share this with you guys because sometimes 
when God gives us a vision and gives us revelation to things, sometimes we must understand that it's not always meant to be spit out all the time. Fourteen years later, after Paul's experience, he shares the experience, but he doesn't share the detail. And, you know, it's one of those things I started to think, you know, what would be uh, something, I, I started to think about uh, Mary when she had Jesus and she just was holding him and she was just thinking. Not saying a word, just thinking. Right? When, when God speaks to us, because I want you to understand that God speaks to all of us, each one of you, you may not recognize His voice right now. It might be a little, you know, faded, but I want you to know that God speaks to you. Okay? And the more and more you start to listen and recognize His voice, the better you get at, at realizing that it's God speaking. Now, when God speaks, there's times that what He shares with us is meant just for us to grow. Sometimes you'll share stuff with you about other people that it's not even for you to share about other people. There's a time frame in God's plan when everything will play out. You don't become more holy because you had a vision and a revelation. You know, people think, oh, if I can tell you a good story, then, you know, man, you don't think I'm good. Well, we already know. We're not good. We corrupt. We all for short of the glory of God. So stop trying to be a super apostle. Just be a lover of Jesus. Just the way you are, let God use you to change the world you live in. Okay? So he goes on to say that he has not, he wasn't given permission to say what it was. Verse 5 to 6, we see Paul contrasting himself or comparing himself to his apostles and he's basically saying you know uh, you know those guys they waste no time jumping on this uh, idea of sharing what the vision and revelation that they had but like I said again some of those stuff not meant to be given out there's a time uh, so there's a lot of stuff that uh, when I'm praying God about uh, reveals to me and God tells me stuff uh, and I just wait and I wait and I wait and I let it play out so I know exactly what it is that God is trying to reveal to me uh, you know I, I, I don't go out and say hey you know what I have a vision about you that cut off and you was running right and this and this and this sometimes if the Lord tells you to go out and say something, give somebody a word, then you give it. Other times, you hold on to that, and you know what I realize, a lot of times it's for us to go into prayer. God has called us to be the person to intercede in prayer. I had uh, several experiences. Uh, one of the uh, experiences was I had this friend, and they came and they asked me to pray about something, and they said that, uh, uh, that they asked me that when God gives a word, if I could tell them or share with them what the word was. Uh, so I was in prayer and, you know, I, I said, okay, Lord, is there something I'm supposed to pass over to them? You know, is there something you want me to say? I mean, what is it? Because I don't know. But my heart is to encourage all believers to continue to see God and, and believe that God is, you know, willing and, and able to reveal all things to us. And then the Lord showed me something that wasn't really like a good ending. And I, you know, I, I, I got up and I woke you up and I said, uh, you know, I'm praying about this stuff, right? You know, she said, like, yeah. And I said, I'm not going to tell them what I saw. You know what I mean? I said, that's crazy. I don't I gotta keep praying and just trust that God is doing something. Uh, and and just let that be that way. And so she asked me if uh, did I feel like God prompting me to say it? Uh, something I said no. 
I, I just feel like God told me that it was more of me to pray, be ready to pray. And, and over them that their hearts wouldn't harden after the event would take place. So, you know, Cal's like, kid, you know, you know whatever, do whatever, you know, <laughs> that's it. So, uh, I believe it was three months later, exactly what I told her happened. And, you know, I'm freaking out, right? Because, you know, we only hear God and we got answers like, whoa, you know, let's spook me out, you know? And then Cal was like, wow. Uh, so what are you going to do? I said, that I don't think I'm supposed to ever say anything. I'm supposed to have just been in prayer. And the prayer was that their hearts would be guarded. I am so blessed uh, because it was so tragic that they were waiting in their feet. And, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I believe that was God's way of uh, interceding. God will tell people to pray for you, right? Uh, today, they are strong believers. That incident that almost ripped them apart, you know, and dissolved their whole family, was saved. And I don't think it was because of me. I, I know it was because of God. But I'm so blessed and to be used by God for something that was beyond my understanding and my ability. Paul, I started to think about Paul, you know, because we're going to talk a little bit. Look, we might, okay, I'm going to get what I'm going to say now. I want us to keep this in your back memory, okay, because when we get to the thorn in Paul's side, we're going to make this connection, okay? I, I tend to talk and my brain go crazy, I might forget to make the connection, okay? So if I do, talk to me later, I'll make the connection for you. Some wire is kind of loose, okay? Uh, so, why I'm saying this is because uh, Paul, what, what is the purpose of a vision and revelation? Right? It works, it's, 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 it's twofold, the revelation and vision. Okay? The one is that it's the benefit of the people, or the, you know, for the unbelievers like us. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Hoku has a revelation and a vision, and God is using her, and uh, that vision is a benefit to us when it's shared in the way that God is saying it. The second reason uh, for a, a, a revelation or a vision in this case, you know, like I said, it's twofold, is that she's going to have to go through some real difficult times as a believer. Remember, Satan's not going to just let you skate through the world. And, and, and I want you guys to understand this. Although God does not make bad things happen, there will be times where God will let your faith be tested. Okay, again? God does not make bad things happen, but there is times when our faith will be tested. God will let it happen. How many of you guys heard the story of Job? Right? God let his faith be tested. In fact, I was just talking to a mini church last week. I said, you know, Paul is to me is like a, 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 a what we call a modern day uh, Job story. He, 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 he just went through some really rough times. His faith was being tested. And I think, okay, when I start putting this here, because how the scripture is written and how God works, that part of that revelation and that vision that he had was for him to have strength to endure what has to take place. You know, a lot of times, you know, uh, I'm going to share something real personal. So, I've been praying to God about a whole bunch of stuff. And then, you know, my mini church has been a really a big part of it. Um, there's, how should I say this? There's stuff in my life that when I was praying, God gave me a word. Uh, that never made sense to me before or the, the life that my 
the way my life was right, didn't make sense. Later, a word would come to my devotion to put everything into place. And, 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 and I believe that when God spoke to me, now I was able to connect the dots. And that part, that word, I use it a lot now, is uh, words is uh, my portion. You see, uh, a lot of times, uh, God will reveal to us true vision and revelation our portion that we got to carry. I was really cool. I think it's a devotion that we had too. I think I read it today or the yesterday. Again, I'm reading too much stuff, you know. Uh, but about this guy who thought that God gave him a mission, and some kind of task to take, and it was to make human on captain. And so he's like, that's beyond me. How can I do that? That's too big. There's something that I cannot handle. Right? And uh, I was so moved by that devotion because that's how God works. When it's too big for us to handle, it's when we find each other hands up in the air and say, okay, Lord, now you have your way. I did all that I can. I cannot do any more. Right? And so we go, so, you know, uh, this is me. This is how I go. So it's up to you, man. You know, it's how I talk to God. It's up to you. Or whatever you decide, because I, I, I'll be here. But I don't like it. I don't think it's cool. I don't blame thing. But if it means that much to you, I'll do it. I was showing in the mini church, this is my one. I'm trying not to fall apart. My uh, one, one goal, uh, one so goal is to love God. To Whatever it takes, that it will be God by. Even if I think it sucks, right? Even though I think I get it the short end of the stick kind of thing. What matters most is that the name of the Lord be revealed, right? Be recognized, be uh, understood. I wasn't supposed to even try. <laughs> I want to be with my stuff. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but I was sharing with uh, my mini church. That's not one goal. It's just to love God that way. And I think, you know, when we see this going on with Paul, this is the heart of Paul. In the midst of all that's going on, he goes, my life sucks. You know, uh, he, we read the list of the stuff he went through, right? A couple of weeks ago. And he goes, all that didn't matter. All that mattered was in those times where people would say that I was weak. In those times when people would uh, claim I'm not in love with the Lord or I did something wrong. You know, during those times is when I drew on the strength of the Lord. And what matters is not what I went through, but how I got through. So, when we have these, these uh, revelations and visions, we must understand how it's working. So Paul realizes that now it's time for it to come to a place where it will continue to bless the people as well as continue to strengthen him. 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 6 to 10, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one would think more of me than is warned by what I do or say. Or because of these surprisingly great revelations, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, 
to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is like crazy. I mean, this is so beautiful. It is like, and to me, this is like an awesome love letter of his love relationship with God. It is crazy. The Lord in his side. Um, I, I love this because Paul shares something that we probably won't even think about. But you know one of the things we all struggle with, every single one of us, right, is pride. Every single one of us is just, just something that gets to us, whether we want to look good, be good, you know, it's just pride will just take us to a place where if we're not careful, God is pushed aside and we rise up. It's just something in us, right? How many of you guys wanted to be on famous rock star or, you know, famous something that everybody was going to look at you and go, wow, God, that, yeah, you know? Whatever it is, you want it to be the best that people would really recognize you. That's right. Yeah. Paul says that he's not immune to that. In fact, he says, you know, this is why I have a thorn in my side. God knew. See? God knew that if we don't humble ourselves, right? We get ourselves in trouble. Again, this is one of the big problems in the church, and it is so frustrating. I, I think we ought to respect our leaders and our pastors, right? But they are not God. They will not throw, they, they will do nothing for your salvation, right? We team up together to worship God. Salvation one-on-one. -on -one. You find the church, you are to commit to that church. The Lord sees that. There's nothing wrong with that. And you are to love and honor your leaders and the pastor. But you are to worship God alone. Does that make sense? You see, a lot of times in the church, the, the, the leaders and the pastors will get real pride for it. Somehow be daily. You know? That's why if you guys notice, I don't like to pray all the time. You think because I'm a pastor, I'm supposed to pray about everything. Give me a break, you know what I mean? Sometimes I don't like to pray. Right? They go, oh, I have their prayer. We'll do that at all, but you know, oh, you're the pastor. So, right? That just means on Sunday I work. That's what that means. <laughs> My prayer is no different than any of your prayers out there. I just have a task and a, a duty to do for the kingdom of God that is different. But when it comes to the power of God operating, He operates in all of us. Yes, God will use the past, don't get me wrong, and the leaders in, a, you know, in, in certain ways. But I don't want any of the congregations to feel that they get adequate because they never hit a certain level. We all hit that level when we accepted Jesus Christ in our life. You know what that level is? Holy Ghost. You have the power of the Holy Spirit just like I do. It's just that certain times and situations like this, I have a different authority and anointing working at this moment. That's it. Yeah, I gotta pray more, I gotta read more. Yeah, I should, but I'm a pastor, right? I mean, you know, you gotta read more. Yeah, you suck. You know? But yeah, you learn more discipline. 
you know, this is where we talk about in many church. When we become believers, the more we know, the more responsible we become. The more responsible you become. Why do you get, why you have to be more responsible? Because you hold more knowledge and the authority of God in the life of someone who is committed and dedicated to the Lord. Different levels. Yeah? Nothing wrong with that. You know, one of the things I share with you guys in the years, you've heard these things before. You know who I like praying for me? No offense to anybody. I like the Katie to pray for me. You know, I, they believe that God will heal me. They believe that God will do something. Not like us older people or the Lord, if it's your will that they listen to me. If give me a break. Sometimes the people pray for me, I'm like, wait, 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 you pray for me or you, you know, condemning me. We supposed to let God have his way. But the hard about this is that when we put a lot of times as older people, we analyzing our prayer. Kids when they shoot them out. Even if they don't know what they're praying, they're shooting them out anyway. I still like that prayer, prayer. You know, because it's so unique and so, so innocent. So, we hear this. Uh, so, Paul says that there's a thorn in his side. Right? The reason for sharing uh, his visit wasn't to glorify him, but to explain why he was dealing with what he was dealing with in his life. Nobody knows what this thorn on his side was. Okay? You take the Greek word, you know how we think about thorn and yeah, we think about like the kukuya, the teabe tree. No, no, that, that's not even big. In fact, if we even get a little bit more crazy and you think about the crown of thorns, which is this huge, two so three inches of thorns, that still doesn't compare to the description that Paul is using concerning the thorn in his sight. The Greek word used for thorn is a stake, a uh, tent stake. He has seen those big tent stakes, you know, big wooden stakes. That's what he's talking about. The thorn in his sight was so obvious that everybody could see it. You know, you read different stories and I think they have like about six different possibilities. Right? And that's all that is, possibilities. But we have to take that out of the picture because then we start to categorize the thorn. Right? Ah, was that a rose thorn? Or, you know, Kiawe or No, no. I love it because then when he takes the Greek word and he goes, it was a thorn like that big. Oh, there we go. Uh, that big. So he was saying that it wasn't a minor irritation in his life. It was huge. We don't know how long this was bothering him, but it humbled him. Right? It humbled him. And I don't know if that was part of the reason or part of the things that the false teachers started to point at. Look at Paul. He said he loved God, but look at what he did with. How can you love God and be like that? Shocks. What a really narrow-minded bunch of people. Because I don't know anybody here right now whose life is perfect. We all want to something. And because of what you went on uh, uh, through in your life, the degree of it determines whether God loves you or not, or if God want, you know, is part of your life or not, that's stupid. Sorry. A drug addict walked through the door, seeking God, wanting to know God, a believer 50 years here, right? The, the, the non-believer or the drug addict guy standing there is just brand new. Does that mean God doesn't want to work in that life? It doesn't mean that God never touched that life? No, that's, that's ridiculous. In fact, I love when we see these kind of people come in because they're so broken. They say, God, you have my way. Have your way with me. I'll do whatever. 
the danger with the religious people, which can be us, is that we become religious. We start thinking and analyzing everything, and because we do that, we, we start putting people in categories, and then we miss the simplicity of church again. Right, we're going to talk about it last week. What is the secret to the success of the church? Love God, love people. That is the secret, the success of church. And when I say church, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. It is sad that the church has lost that. Paul says what he was dealing with was so bad that it was there to remind him to be humble. In fact, he goes on, I love this, that he goes, three times I pray. Yeah, for me, I think that's a little bit. Three times. You know how many times I went to God in prayer? Well, again, we take the Greek word or the Greek history of the, of the Hebrews, right? And we take these words and we put them together. It is said that the Hebrew figure of three meant a lot. It wasn't just three. It was many, many times. I love this because when you start doing that, now three sounds pretty good to me because I don't know about you, but I've been to God more than three times in prayer over something. Right? I, I still, I think, 1,500 right now. You know what I mean? They're like, oh Lord, this is a 1,500 time just in case you wanted to know if I was counting. Right? I don't know if you guys that, but I am like, Lord, you know, like, how oh, many times did I come? You know? Um, People, it's so funny because when we hear this, uh, you know, I, 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 I wonder how many of us think that if we ask Him more than one time, that we lack faith. Or if we ask Him more than uh, one time, that means that we don't really believe God will do anything. But you know that in the garden, when Jesus is praying, you know that he went back three times? When he asked the Lord to take the cup from, from him, three times? What is the heart behind that? You know, I, I said reading scripture and I said realizing, you know, that we don't give up until we get an answer. I love Paul because he keeps asking and asking. You know, because sometimes we can find the desperate part of our, our heart in the asking. Right? Some of us, we just ask him because we like convenience. Oh Lord, you know what? Uh, just bless me this because this, 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 this. It's not, we don't even need it. We don't really want it. We just like convenience. But I love it because Paul is asking and asking and asking and he's not going to stop to get an answer. I, I would say the same to you, don't stop to get an answer. Because God will answer. In fact, we find, <coughs> we find that Paul gets his answer, right, in, in verse 9. So let me tell you, my grace is sufficient. Here God gives Paul the answer, and the crazy thing is it's not the answer that Paul liked. I was actually, you know, when I read this and I was working on this, I, I was like, man, brother Paul, I understand you right now. Right? Because how many times you pray and then you ask God and you got you an answer and that's not the answer you like. Do you know that God will relieve us from our burden in two ways? You have a burden. You're asking God to remove that burden. You're asking God to, you know, help you to do it. Two ways that God will remove a burden in your life. In this case, let's call it the thorn in your side. The first way is you will remove it. You'll take it out. 
get it out of your life. We all like that one. Right? The second and most commonly uh, seen or way that is how uh, often God's way of working is God will give us the strength to endure that thorn in our flesh. You see, a lot of times we will get the same answer like Paul. Lord, take this from me. Jesus, take this cup from me. And the Lord says, the cup you got to carry, but let me give you the strength to carry the cup. You know, uh, when I was telling you earlier, I was thinking about Kama, uh, and I thought of other people. You know, a lot of times, uh, people would ask you as a believer, you know, hey, you, you know, how come this, or how come that is happening to you, or this, you know, that you believe, what your God can heal you. But that kind of question comes from a non-believer. You cannot answer that kind of question with an answer that will satisfy them. But you can show them the answer that will change their heart. That you would endure the time. That you will be strengthened. That they will see you broken and humbled before God, crying out to God for strength and power. And at the end of the race, at the end of that task, they will answer their own question by what they have seen you in work. You see, it's so crazy. Non-believers will come up with these, try to we'll get these questions to try to trip you and trick you because you cannot answer those, not in the way that they're going to receive the answer. But what they cannot deny is the proof of your life. When you're hanging in there, regardless of what circumstances you have. You know, uh, there's a season uh, in our church where we had a bunch of people who were sickly and, you know, uh, they went on to live with the Lord. Uh, you know, Uncle Bob, uh, Auntie Keiko, Auntie Nao, and then my sister, you know, I was like, wow, you know what, I said I love you. by other people, if God is God, then why? Why then? I don't know. I cannot answer that question. That's, that's asking an open hand question, you know, like, so why the world falling apart? You know what I mean? I, I don't know. It, it, it's supposed to happen. That's all I can tell them. You know, the Bible says, all men must die. That's what I mean, that's what I can tell you. But what I've always known away with is that people will come back and they would always refer to their faith. The people that pass, they would refer to their faith. Oh, they would love the Lord. And I said, baby, you know, wow. That, that's the big deal with that. You see, people may not understand it, but the cup that they had to carry, that was their portion at that time. And God gave him the strength. You know, I, I, I keep cracking up when I think about um, when I when this stuff. I always hear Uncle Bob. Keep praying. Never stop praying. Pray all the time. And they were in life. Just pray. You know, and he's a little drunk. Uh, knucklehead. Oh my gosh. Uh, but I realized this, you know. I was really encouraged by all these different people, which the Bible talks about, being encouraged by all these people of faith that went before us. You know what? I don't have all the answers. But I can tell you this, that if 
Whatever you go through in your life, whatever would hurt you, whatever would destroy you, whatever would break you, whatever is causing you to not give it all up to God, I, I want to encourage you to surrender to Him and let Him have His way. Later on, it will all make sense. But if we're trying to figure it all out before the plan is able to be unfolded, we're not. We're going to get confused, angry, frustrated, and it's going to hinder our walk with the Lord. There's a time that we have to just let go, trust God, and let God live in those unfavorable times in our life as the soul provider and comforter. So, verse 10, when I am weak, I am strong. Here we see God's mighty hand at work. Uh, the Paul, like I said, the thorn in Paul's side wasn't to keep Paul uh, weak. It wasn't to punish him, right? It was a, it was a law God's divine strength to be seen through him. You know, when we go into something, uh, when we start getting big crying kind, right? Because we talk about the two about us, right? But the goal of worshiping and, and, and praising God is that we would be the the vessel used to bring glory to his name. And guess what? That's one of the avenues. Right? Allow God to show His divine strength through our weaknesses, through our struggles. Let Him, have, let Him be the guide that holds us up. Right? Now, let me see. Let's get ready to end. I, I want to encourage you with a couple of things. Let me encourage you with this. Okay? Uh, Paul's enemies, and, and I want you to see this in mind, saw the thorn in Paul's life, but what they couldn't see was how or why it was there. I want you guys to always think about this when you guys look at other people. Right? You have no idea what that thorn in their life is there for. You know, a lot of times we look at that person and we say, oh, you never do this, you never do this, you have to do this. It may be true, but you know what? Like Paul, who had some severe battle scars, right? People was judging him. They had no idea that the scars, that the battles that he had gone through, the purpose was fitted for him by God. Right? So we have to be people that realize that we don't know what it was, what was going on, but can we love them past that? Let us love them besides the, you know, oh, look at you. You know, uh, one of the things that I say, when the alcoholic or drug addict, you know, my dad is going to come in through the door, can we love them with the heart of God and see the soul that God is trying to save instead of judging them and saying, okay, well, you know, you'll never, never be ready for God. You, you're not ready. Get clean first. I never get clean first when I came to church. I got clean after I came to church. I still get clean. Yeah? You know, I, I know I do all those other things, but no in brain idea is so damaged that God is working with me daily to get my thought life and clear my heart and my wounds from battling that if God would love me, then why I have to go through all of this stuff? We live in a world where bad things happen. I praise God that I found him. Now the healing process can begin. I will close with this. Uh, and it's actually from um, 
brilliant. I, I, I love it. Sometimes he writes kind of weird, you know, because he's like old, old, old. But if you just sit, sit some, uh, some time meditating to the Code Satan, uh, we should never think that in our lives, the mere presence of a thorn means the glory and strength of Jesus which shine in us and through us. You might resist God's grace and refuse to set your mind on Jesus and then find your thorn cursing you instead of blessing you. Without the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, thorns are productive of evil rather than good. In many people, the thorn in the flesh does not appear to have fulfilled any admirable design at all. It has created an otherwise instead removing a temptation. Really cool stuff. It, it's weird the way, right? But you know, you read a little, a little bit more, you do a little bit of it's cool. See that? I think we need to be people that need wisdom. That the things in our life, if we are looking to get through it, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God will give us the power that's needed, the strength that's needed, that we would be victorious. Now, catch this up. Victorious that His name will be glorified. And that we would be sustained through the time of that situation, the trial, whatever it may be. Does it make sense? Yeah? But it's great.